Okay, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Sandra Moreau. I'm the director of uh, an NGO called IDEA, uh, which stands for International Debate Education Association. And we've been uh, working for nearly a year now with um, um, the Solvay Debating Society and Brussels Debater. Um, and because our aim is to uh, promote debate to young people and uh, to enable them to develop their critical thinking and to develop arguments and to be more aware of what's happening in the world. So tonight's debate, as you can see uh, on uh, the screen, is about uh, immigration, which is now a matter that has become uh, a crisis in Europe. So um, I hope you will enjoy um, tonight's debate. Mr. F Speaker of the proposition, you have the floor. We are right now on the verge of the biggest refugee crisis since the end of the Second World War, caused mostly by the Syrian crisis in both Syria and Iraq. So we believe that it is Europe's duty to accept all refugees. Let's go by, to it step by step. First of all, why is it Europe's duty? Um, it's important to mention that neighboring countries already did their part of the job. Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan already took over four and a half million refugees, which represents over 95% of the total number of refugees. The, peop the amount of refugees coming over to Europe is between a quarter million and half a million, which represent a drop in the ocean of the f over 500 million inhabitants in Europe. Um, let's not forget Europe's role in the Middle East. During the last centuries, we help write the entire history of both the Middle East and North Africa. We messed up some things, we messed up a lot of things. And we can't now just leave and say, it's your mess, you deal with it. We made this mess, we have to help them clean it up. So what do we mean by refugees? There is a real difference between the word refugee and immigrant. A refugee is someone that was forced to leave their home country or home region against their will because they faced death or war. And an immigrant is just someone who seeks a better life. So we want to make this distinction very clear from the get-go. We are not talking about just opening our borders completely and letting everybody in without distinction. We want refugees to uh, register and be part of a database so that we have the chance to refuse people who might pose a threat to our society, as we do with people from our society right now who pose a threat to our society with the prison system. Uh, under Article 78, Subsection 3 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, ratified by every member state, we already decided to accept the refugees. So now is not the time to go back on our word and say, yes, we just did it, in, but we didn't think it would happen. We ratified this law, and we have to accept what we said. And now, why all refugees? First of all, why, what would we do if we don't take in all refugees? Would we say, you yes, you no, you yes, you no? Who are we to play God like this? We can't. We can't just decide who lives and who dies at our borders. That's not how it works. But during the last refugee crisis, our ancestors fled Europe to the US, to South America, but also to Africa and the Middle East. And who are we to now say, you saved our grandparents, your grandparents saved our grandparents, but now we are not going to save the grandchildren of the people who saved us. That's just not how it works. So we now have very young refugees that are well-educated. They are really, really similar to us. 
They too spend a lot of time on the internet. They too like to waste a lot of work time on Facebook looking at very cute cat videos. The only difference between them and us is that right now, when we are done wasting time at work on Facebook, we take the metro and we go home. When they are done, there is warfare going on in their backyard. There are people dying because of chemical warfare and methods that have been banned for over a hundred years and that are still used by both ISIS and the al-Assad regime. So, who are we to say, stay where you are and die where you are and to refuse them? How do we want to be remembered? Do we want to be remembered as xenophobic cowards hiding behind our high fences? Or do we want to act now in order to have never to see tragic images of dead children washing ashore on our borders. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And now I call the first speaker of the opposition team. Dear members of the parliament, dear audience, uh, and uh, my fellow members and the judges. That was really a very passionate speech. Thank you. Um, what we would like to establish here that it is not Europe's duty to accept all refugees. Remember the word all. And what is Europe's role in accepting refugees should be, in our opinion, should be proportionate, should be sustainable, should be in line with the interest and the rights of the domestic population of Europe as well as of the refugees. And we should have a, uh, we should actually set up um, uh, safety and security of all of these people, including the, uh, the people who are living in the Europe as well as for, of the refugees. Now, I do understand uh, uh, Prime Minister has, uh, has mentioned that uh, there are, um, I mean, he is suggesting that there should be a, a need for uh, immediate action. Uh, a database should be set up, uh, should be registered, uh, everyone. However, I do not know if that is really uh, possible. Um, in, in a short term notice. However, what is possible that we're going to propose uh, in our three major points, which is the proportionality, which is the capacity, second one is capacity and sustainability, and third is the security. In terms of proportionality, I would, uh, I'll take you later. Um, in, in terms of proportionality, what we would like to say that it is not only Europe's duty to take all refugees. Look at the the real reason of this whole war. I mean, it is the, it is the uh, Gulf countries who have their vested interest in Syria to create that uh, whole mess there. They have uh, actually sent up their uh, armies and also indirectly they have helped to fight between Syrians and Sunnis in Syria. And the result is four million people are on the street. They are actually fleeing, they fled the country. Now, who is really responsible for that? That the Gulf countries, why Europe's burden it is that to accept all of them, of course Europe should do what it can do, but Europe is not capable of doing everything. Europe cannot be capable of uh, you know, handling this influx of uh, millions of people who are coming over. But why Europe should take more than a million people of refugees and how many refugees uh, the Gulf countries have taken? Zero, a big zero. And, uh, and, and I would like to say um, th there was, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you, um, and, and there is something I, I would like to quote, uh, and the Kuwaiti official, uh, it, uh, has, uh, his name is Fahid al-Salami, uh, he actually explained this thing on, on a television network, um, it was published that, on the question that why Gulf countries are not taking uh, any refugees, and he said that our countries are good for working people only. And we do not want to accept refugees because the cost is too high. And remember the, his last sentence. That's really amazing. He said that we do not want people in our country who have suffered from internal stress and trauma. Can you imagine? I mean, we are talking about human rights. We are talking about philanthropy. philanthropy. That's what the people who, the IC, OIC and Arab League people, that, that their view on the whole, whole crisis. And we are actually taking one step ahead and we're actually trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, give shelter to all people. Uh, this is not fair. Everybody should have their fair 
uh, uh, should share the fair responsibility. What they have created, they should actually take back some of the uh, result that that they have uh, they have done. Okay, thank you. So basically, what you're suggesting that in the middle of a refugee crisis where people are fleeing war and uh, persecution. Uh, Europe shouldn't accept them because Europe was not the direct, uh, the direct responsible of the war in Syria, and that should be the reason because uh, it wasn't Europe the one who uh, put Syria at war. Thank you. So um, what I would like to say that uh, first of all, what I me meant that uh, and, and I made it very clear that Europe should do what it can do. But it is not Europe's responsibility to accept all refugees that are coming to its doorstep now. And Europe is never has a direct interest in, the, in this whole Syrian war. It is the Af Gulf countries and also USA who has created this whole mess. Let's say in Libya, who has, uh, if there is no Gaddafi, then there wouldn't have been the whole Mediterranean, Mediterranean coast wide open for the smugglers to, to send out uh, the, the, the people, the refugees to the Europe. Uh, and many of them have perished, unfortunately. So who is really responsible? And they should take, take back some of their responsibility. Very quickly, jumping on the second point, the capacity and, and, and sustainability, what I would like to uh, build upon here is that um, it is a second, like you said, it's an influx, a second highest influx after the World War. And uh, most of the uh, Eastern European countries and Central European countries are not capable of handling this vast amount of refugees in their in their countries and we should actually take refugees only that is needed that 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 this, these countries can hold in their in their countries thank you thank you now i'm calling the second speaker of the proposition team So first of all, I will answer, I will address your point. So also, we agree that it should be a sustainable security, securitized process. We are not agree at all when you focus all your point about the proportionality principle, which for, in our view, um, a totally energyless and um, really a dangerous principle in this crisis, because it's a bit the same concerning gas emissions. Uh, China says we have the right to pollute because European countries have polluted in the past. So it's the same when you say, okay, these countries are not taking one, we don't have to take in one. Moreover, that's not humanitarian. You're talking about those people, and it'd be a weight, things that you have to take. I mean, if we see on the statistics, those people, they are skilled, they are tech savvy, they have studied, they come from countries they have achieved their uh, demographic transition, which means that it is over the period wh where they had seven children. No, they are at three in Syria. So I will continue with what is our main point, is that if my colleague has not yet convinced us that this crisis will really change the way we conceive our society, just take one report of 2008 of the World Bank, they say simply, that the, 20, that the aggregated 20 richest percent of our population, are, uh, the richest of their population, of the immigrant, is still poorer than the 20th poorest percent of our population. Moreover, in this globalized world, where exchanges are easier than ever, in addition that these people, as I uh, already said, are cultivated and they are tech-savvy, you can imagine that it's not just a globalization of multinational companies, but that we really reach uh, the dimension of this globalization with the globalization of flows, of people flows. And yes, we have to accept it, they will intensify. This brings us to the second point, that in our point of view, the main issue is integration. Why integration? Because integration first is not assimilation. Because we think we cannot make those people the same citizen as, as us. We have to accept the difference. We have to use their richness and their diversity. That's in this idea of mixity. It is, on the other hand, not also doing nothing and just waiting. Because it will lead us to ghettoization, to communitarism, 
and there's really not a solution in our societies today. So we have to share a common basis of values, and Europe, Europe is capable of that. For yes. So are you saying that uh, the Eastern European countries, which uh, which uh, are which are uh, primarily actually uh, not accepting the refugees, they uh, it is it is quite okay that uh, we actually force upon the refugees on them, even they do not want. Them. <coughs> uh, can you repeat, please? So the Eastern European countries uh, who actually do not want to accept uh, many of the refugees uh, compared to the Western countries, uh, it will be quite okay uh, that uh, we actually force upon the refugees on them, even they do not want. No, because this situation of statu quo is a really dangerous situation. Not just because it's human traffic, but also for Schengen itself. It could be the destruction of Schengen. So, yes, Europe has to be strong, and we have to be strong when we say we have a solution for those countries, we have an integration solution, and we also know how to allocate those people to give them, as soon as possible, uh, activities, uh, lessons, and even to be EU citizens if they want to stay. So, that leads us to the second point and the main point that integration is really not just about religion or culture, it's also economic and social. Why was the Irish integration in the US such a success? Or take the Italian one in the 60s. Because there was there were activity, there were opportunities, there were jobs. So we have to provide those people with the same opportunities. Uh, last point, when people say it is not um, it is not uh, possible because of the population, because they are really different for a uh, religious reason. I say it's not a problem of people, it's not a problem of population, it's a problem of institutions. So we have to, to provide those people with better and fairer institutions. And that's what the, the last 30 years economic development theory was about, to provide them better institutions. So it's not the problem of people in our point of view, so we can integrate those peoples. Thank you. calling the second speaker of the opposition team. Sorry, am I ready to go? Yep. Okay, first of all, thank you everybody for inviting me here today to speak on this issue. Um, the motion is that all refugees should be uh, accepted in Europe and we disagree with that. I'd like to rebut a couple of points first from, from the government team before I move on to the argument. Uh, firstly, with speaker one, I was extremely happy when you raised that distinction. Uh, you said not talking, you're not talking about opening borders completely. Uh, you do believe in the chance to refuse people. And we completely agree with you. I mean, that's what we're arguing here tonight. And actually, I was thinking of inviting you over to join us after you said that. <laughs> but um, what you did, I suppose, was you took, you, you made all less than all. And uh, we really appreciate that point that you made. Uh, what I would like to point out is that I know that you came back and said, why allow all? Uh, you know, we can't, we, we're making decisions about people living and dying, and it's true, it's a very serious thing. And we don't want people to die. Uh, but what we're trying to do is find a solution that's fairer and more sustainable than the present solution that's put on the table in front of us. I'll take it in a while. Uh, the second um, point that I wanted to make was to, to my friend over here, the second speaker, when he said that you don't agree with proportionality. And you, you mentioned that, in fact, it's dangerous. But one of your key arguments here tonight is that the proportion of refugees in the neighboring countries is too high. And that's why you're arguing that they should be sent to Europe. And you know, so, in other words, you actually do care about proportion. You just don't know that you care about proportion. Okay, so moving on to our own arguments. We have, we have said that whole issue of, of proportion is important. And does it not amaze you that the rich Gulf states are not taking any refugees in. Does, does that not amaze people sitting here tonight? I mean, I think that's, that's quite a stunning uh, situation. And what, no, I'll take it in a while, please. What I would like to, to point out is if we're going to think about these things, like we're, we're trying to think globally these days, and we should be trying to think what's a global solution to this. And a global solution to this is not saying Europe should take all refugees. It's, it's not the way we should be thinking about the way the world is today. I would like to point out also as well the, the argument of security. And let's take a look at what's been going on in the world in the last 15 years. You know, the, the reality is security has been a huge, huge issue. I mean, 
when you think about all the developments and all the sort of infringements on civil liberties, all the new technology that's been brought into airports, into, you know, it's just been very, very high profile the whole period of time. And the reason for that is there has been a real security threat in Europe during those years. I mean, none of us forget what happened in Spain. I was living in Spain when those bombings happened in, in Madrid. Uh, none of us forget what happened in London. I was working in London about to bring a group of students to, and I'm not responsible for the bombs, I can tell you all. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the impact of these things, and like we've had our own example here in Belgium only a year ago, and we've had our own example in, in somebody from Belgium picked up a Kalashnikov or something and drove, uh, went down to Paris and tried to, to you know, rob a train or kill everybody or whatever it was. This is really uh, something that's serious. And when you've got people like the Lebanese education minister, uh, if I can find his name here, I'll give it to you. I definitely have it somewhere. But anyway, he, uh, yes, it's Elias Boasar. When you have somebody like him you know, making a public announcement that 2% of the refugees, no thank you, uh, 2% of the refugees coming into Europe are actually uh, jihadists. I mean, I think we should actually listen to that. And really, you know, we don't have to get paranoid about it, but what we have to say is that, yes, it's true. A lot of these people are arriving paperless into Europe. A lot of these people are paying smugglers huge money and taking extremely dangerous routes that 2,500 people have drowned on this year. And if we ratify that, if we say, you know, that all, all refugees come into Europe, we're, we're in a way, we're legitimizing that approach to coming into Europe. No, thank you. So what we would, um, what we would say here is that we need to take a step back from this and look at the bigger picture. The way this would work better is if those people knew there was a process by which they could come. The process from, they move to the neighboring countries, they go through a processing uh, uh, story that, or situation there, and then they are brought in a very safe way into countries that are actually willing to accept them and ready to accept them. What we've got at the moment is a floodgates. You know, that's sort of, it's, it's, it's sort of happened and now we're trying to sort of deal with it after it's happened instead of being prepared for it. And what we really need to do is stand back, look at the situation again and just say how can we do it better and how can we do it in partnership with, with everybody, uh, not just with ourselves in Europe in a self-contained type of way. So I know that, that idealistically we'd all love to, you know, we, we all love to veer on the, the idealistical side of things but sometimes we have to do a reality check as well. And if you look at what's going on in the EU, you see the, the, really what you see is the decline of Schengen. You see like Hungary putting up borders, Germany closing borders, Austria closing borders. Uh, you know, that was like the crowning achievement of the EU. Some of you are too young to remember this, but I remember before all of that, you know, before Schengen, and it is one of the greatest, greatest achievements, and now it's, it's, it's sort of gone. So, uh, for, suspended for now. What, what happens if we don't act in these situations is countries move apart from each other. You end up with Slovakia making statements like we're not taking Muslim refugees. You end up with the Hungarian Prime Minister saying we're protecting a Christian tradition of a thousand years. You end up with the Finnish MP going on his Facebook and saying that multiculturalism is a disease. This is what happens if, if we don't think through Thank How you. is the EU constructed and Thank we you, respect Mr. that way Speaker. it works. Thank you. Thank you.